Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar. This is Debbie Brown, and I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Paul Weigel today. Dr. Weigel is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and associate medical director at Natchog Hospital of Hartford Healthcare in Connecticut, where he serves as medical staff president. He is co-chair since 2002 of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry's Media Committee. He has authored numerous articles on the effects of video game and internet habits on the mental health of youth and regularly speaks on the topic to physicians, parents, and mental health professionals. Today, Dr. Weigel will discuss research and clinical experience, which reveals ways parents can protect youth health, youth health risks associated with video game habits, as well as potential treatments for pathological youth. Welcome, Dr. Weigel. Thank you. I appreciate the kind introduction, and I want to, I'd like to also thank uh, the International Bipolar Foundation and, and Muffy Walker in particular for the invitation to talk about what I consider to be a very timely and uh, an important topic, and that is uh, excessive, uh, habitual excessive video game play or internet gaming disorder. Now, I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest to disclose, except that I should mention that my interest in this topic comes from three different places. One is that I, uh, I have been a lifelong uh, video game enthusiast myself. Um, I, I do play regularly and sometimes play more than I should. Uh, in addition, m I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist, which means that I, I uh, treat um, uh, young people with, uh, with issues uh, with mental health concerns and, and illness. And uh, many of my patients, particularly my, my male patients, many of their time is really dominated by video game play and so this is a very important part of my patients lives as well um, and finally I'm a parent and uh, and one of my uh, one of my uh, children my son is uh, particularly uh, enthused about uh, about video games and sometimes his interest is uh, bordering on obsessive so I, ha I have an interest in as a parent's perspective as well so I wanted to sort of orient by, uh, by talking a little bit about the history of video games. Um, I sometimes still, still tend to think of video games as a new phenomenon, and they are ever-changing, but certainly not new. Uh, this is the first commercially released uh, video game back in 1972. Some of you may remember it. It was called Pong, and it's a very crude um, uh, representation of ping pong, but it was such a mega hit that its creator, Atari, launched the first home video game console six years later. And I can remember being one of the first kids on my block at a very young age to, uh, uh, to have one of these home video game consoles. Now since then, every six, seven years or so, uh, technology has advanced to the point where a new generation of video game uh, console has been released, um, each one about twice as powerful uh, as the last and significantly more engaging. And the easiest way to see that is by looking at the, at the graphics and how they've evolved uh, over time. So that recently it, it becomes hard to tell sometimes if you're looking at a, uh, a still shot of video game play like this one called Duty Black Ops or if you're looking at a photograph because they've become so uh, so realistic and um, and also more complex and more engaging as well. So with the uh, with video games becoming more complex and engaging, so too has increased uh, the uh, market share of the video game industry. Uh, so again, video games are available commercially since '72, but in the period of '95 to 2008. Uh, video game sales in the United States quintupled or increased by a factor of five and worldwide sales continue to grow from a paltry 20 billion in 2001 to uh, 80 billion in 2012 and an estimated 111 billion this year. Uh, so big, big numbers such that the video game industry is an entertainment juggernaut, uh, bigger than the music industry and by many measures bigger than the film industry as well uh, worldwide. Uh, although television still remains uh, number one, uh, video games are, uh, are, are gaining ground and that may only be a matter of time. 
So uh, with the, the rise of the video game industry, video games have become an indelible part of, of our culture, of our lives and, and the lives of young people. And um, so one question is, it comes up is how much time our kids actually spend, do our kids actually spend playing video games? And some degree of video game play is nearly ubiquitous amongst uh, youth. But, um, but the most recent study was the Common Sense Media Survey, uh, which looks at thousands of kids aged 8 to 18. And they found when comparing with the earlier data, the average time that American youth is spending playing video games has quadrupled uh, since a report in the year 2000. And in general, boys uh, tend to play more, about twice as much as girls. On any given day, 61% uh, of youth uh, play a video game, and those that do play for an average of 2 hours and 13 minutes, um, which is uh, um, uh, over the court, which is only a part of their uh, total uh, overall daily screen time but over the course of the year is about half as much time as kids are spending in school. So this is an enormous amount of time that kids are spending playing video games. Um, and uh, it really has changed the landscape of childhood and adolescence in addition to other forms of electronic media that uh, the kids still engage in, television and internet and mu music and so on and so forth. And um, the data also showed that there's a subsection of boys, about 12% of boys, more teens than, than younger boys, but who play more than four hours a day on average. So there is a substantial minority who are these mega, you know, these, these very heavy users of video games and, and spend, again, about equal to uh, amount of time to that that they spend in school or more time than they spend in school, they spend on video games. Um, so, um, uh, so another thing I should mention that tablets and cell phones have, in the last five years, really transformed uh, the game, uh, video game uh, industry in the way that uh, many uh, of our youth uh, and adults interact with video games. Since just 2011, teen smartphone uh, ownership has tripled uh, to 73%, and, and ownership and access to tablets has tripled as well to nearly 60%. And the market share um, since 2009 uh, of video game sales on tablets and phones has increased sixfold to, to about 50% of video game sales are now on, uh, on these tablets. Other recent trends that I think are important are, is online gaming. Um, it used to be that a minority of games were played online, and uh, most games were just played um, uh, solely contained within the machine that the, uh, that the person is playing them on. But more and more often, uh, all games are, are communicating, or nearly all games are communicating with uh, the cloud and, and online servers uh, during gameplay to alter the game experience and so on and so forth. So, uh, so uh, the newest uh, video game consoles like the Xbox One won't even function without an internet uh, connection. Um, so the, the, distinct, the, the distinguished, uh, di uh, very quickly, uh, it, there's no real, nothing to distinguish between online games and, uh, and solo games. They're, they're more or less all played online to some degree. Another, uh, another um, recent trend is the free-to-play phenomenon, which is um, where games are, uh, have no upfront cost to play. And many of the games that you can play on, your, uh, on tablets and on, um, on cell phones follow this model, most of them. Uh, however, once so it's free to, to start, but once you get engaged in the game, uh, they start charging you a small amount here and there to, um, uh, to advance in the game. And most people don't spend a lot of money on games uh, that, uh, that uh, have this model, but there's a small amount of people that spend a lot of money. And there have been many instances of, uh, of uh, kids who have rung up um, uh, big balances on their parents' uh, Apple um, iTunes account or credit card on these games. And uh, the worst I have seen was there was a, a young man in the Netherlands who rung up $50,000 on his uh, grandparents' credit card. So it can, some, some people spend a lot of money on these types of games. Uh, finally, uh, even though kids are overall spending more time watching television or videos than they are playing video games, um, more and more of the time they spend watching uh, TV and videos is spent watching videos 
of other people playing video games. Most of these are on YouTube. However, um, uh, some of them are also on um, a website called Twitch, and, um, and sometimes it seems my own kids would rather watch a video of someone else playing Minecraft than watch a traditional television show. So that's, those are becoming more popular as well. So the question comes up, are parents uh, controlling the amount of time kids spend playing on video games since they're playing so much? And it depends on who you ask. Um, when uh, Electronic Software Association asked parents, 70% said yes, we have rules. But uh, the Kaiser Family Survey interviewed thousands of American youth, and 72% said no, that there were no rules enforced about how much time they were allowed to spend playing video games. And it made a big, big difference because in that study, those who, who did not have parental rules spent about twice the amount of time playing as their peers. And as a parent, it's easy for me to see why we might be tempted to allow our uh, kids to spend more time playing than perhaps is healthy. When kids are online, they are physically safe, they're happy, and they don't require a lot of our, uh, of our parental attention so that we can get something done or perhaps play a video game uh, ourselves. Um, and in the population that I serve, in uh, youth with uh, psychiatric illness, um, uh, they spend more time playing video game than, uh, games than their peers. A child in psychi psychiatric outpatients spend about 50% more time playing video games uh, than their peers, according to research. In particular, those who spend the most time playing are youth with behavior problems, uh, those with ADHD, and those on the autism spectrum who spend about twice as much time playing video games as their uh, typically developing siblings and peers. I'm, I'm spending most of my time today talking about kids and the habits of, of youth, but I don't mean to imply that this is a problem, that, uh, that uh, excessive video games play is only a problem uh, in youth, or that video game play is only a phenomenon for youth. Uh, most video game players are adult, 74% um, according to market research. The average video game player is 35 years old, um, and uh, most parents who have kids at home play video games regularly, including 74% of moms with, uh, with kids at home. And when I saw that data initially, I was excited to see that, that the parents were playing games with their kids, which I think is a very healthy activity. However, um, as it turns out, they're not. They're typically playing uh, their own uh, video games. But I'm going to be talking about kids mostly because that's where most of the research data is, and that's where my personal experience is. Um, but uh, this is certainly a phenomenon that affects adults as well. So overall, um, when you look at the relationship between video game habits and mental health, um, uh, those uh, youth who have the worst um, psychosocial functioning and lowest life satisfaction are those who play the most, spend the most time playing video games, uh, those who play more than three hours a day of console or computer games, when compared to their peers have, have the worst psychosocial functioning. Um, however, it's uh, those who don't play who don't play any video games at all are not the healthiest. Um, it's actually those who play a little, those who play more than an hour a day. But uh, um, I'm sorry, excuse me, more than nothing but less than an hour a day are are the healthiest. Um, so it seems that in moderation, perhaps you know some some gameplay can be a good thing. Um, but I'm not going to be talking too much about those who play in moderation today. So people often ask me uh, when, I, when I speak on the topic, what makes video games so habit-forming and, and uh, um, what makes them uh, addictive? Um, especially people who don't play video games are the ones who ask this question. And I think it's important to realize that video games meet basic psychological needs that we all have. Number one, um, according to self-determination theory, these needs are competence, autonomy, and relatedness. And we all have the need to feel confident, the need to feel effective in our, in our world. And uh, video games are very good at challenging the player. And when you overcome those challenges, it takes a significant amount of effort and uh, persistence to do so you really feel that you've accomplished something, um, even though perhaps you've just wasted a few hours of your, of your day playing a game. Um, but it doesn't feel that way. Um, so video games can certainly make you feel very competent in the short term. 
Uh, the second one is autonomy. We all have the need to have control over uh, our lives and, um, and compared to other forms of media, uh, video games uh, really allow the player a great deal of control. Unlike passively viewing a movie, when you're playing a video game, you're the one who's in control of the action, of the flow of the story, of success and failure, um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. No other type of entertainment media offers that level of autonomy. Finally, relatedness. Um, uh, video games, uh, of course, the relatedness is the need to feel connected to others, the opposite of loneliness. And, um, and video games uh, are very good at making one feel like they are connecting with others. Studies show that, that interacting with video game characters uh, while playing a game, this is not real people, but video game uh, characters uh, fills that need in the short term. You feel less lonely uh, than if you're engaged in another activity. And, uh, and certainly uh, video games can uh, bring people together online games where you're interacting uh, with others, although naturally not the same as face-to-face uh, -face interaction, very limited. So uh, perhaps it isn't surprising that in those teens who spend the most time playing video games, um, it's actually counterproductive. They feel less competent in, um, in uh, real-world skills than their peers, and it makes sense because they've been devoting so much time to um, perfecting their, uh, their uh, video game skills that they spend less time you know, engaging in uh, real-world activities and developing those skills. They feel less control over their lives, those who play the most video games, feel less control over their lives and less meaning in life than their peers, uh, and they feel less related uh, or less connected to their real-world peers. Um, so it seems that uh, that in the short term video games meet these basic needs, but in the long term, among those who use too much, it can be ultimately uh, counterproductive and unfulfilling. As a video gamer, though, I wanted to express to you about how exciting uh, these uh, games can be and how engaging they can be. Uh, when, when you step into uh, the video game world, and I'm talking about a not, not a simple game like uh, um, like um, Candy Crush, but a more complicated game like World of Warcraft or a hardcore game, as uh, some gamers would call it, you step into a world where you can do all sorts of things that would be difficult or, or impossible in the real world. So once you can accept, once you can suspend your disbelief and engage in this alternate reality, you know that you can really make a difference with your surroundings. You have the power of life and death over those around you, um, and you know that if you stick at it, you can succeed. Um, because again, video games are good at challenging you, but keeping the challenge at a level which it doesn't have too many spikes, which are frustrating, and too many dips, which are boring. Keeping you right at the right level. Um, but you know you'll be able to do it if you stick at it. Um, you know that you can take risks without fear. You don't have to worry. You can do and You don't have to uh, worry about physical physical harm happening to you or death, you'll just get a new character if your character dies in the game. You know if you stick at it, you're going to get better, you're going to get stronger, your character, character is going to have new abilities and, uh, and new opportunities opening up to you. Others in the video game world are going to appreciate you. And this could be real people that you're interacting with through the game, like in World of Warcraft, people who want to collaborate with you to m meet common goals, or video game characters who, uh, to who, who treat you like you're a celebrity. Um, finally, you know that you're going to be rewarded uh, in the game. And again, this is with uh, new abilities and new content. Um, really, uh, it, it, it makes uh, achieving, um, the, achieving your goals much more uh, doable, but still challenging and very engaging. And this is what uh, makes video games preferable to reality for so many video game enthusiasts. Finally, video games um, form something which behavioral psychologists call a compulsion loop, in which video games challenge players to work towards tasks. And again, this is just the right level of challenge, not too difficult and not too easy. Uh, and as players overcome these challenges, this leads to a reward of new content. And again, this could be new abilities in the game, new areas to explore, so on and so forth. And, uh, and as you reach those goals, the challenge level increases 
ever so slightly um, to keep you working and engaged. And of course, video games are designed to be engaging in this way. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, certainly the point. But this perfect level of between boredom and frustration, this perfect level of challenge, um, uh, puts is what artists call being in a state of flow, or sometimes athletes call being in the zone, uh, in this perfect state. And and it. It, there's no natural stopping point uh, to many of these uh, games, which take hundreds of hours to come to a uh, stopping point for some of them, um, an, uh, an ending, I should say. But unlike other forms of media, there really isn't a natural stopping point. So these games can be very hard to put down. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, getting closer to talking about uh, video game addiction, but first of all, defining the term addiction. Addiction is an excessive pattern, compulsive behavior, uh, which is not uh, able to be controlled, leading to significant impairment um, and distress with a number of associated symptoms like uh, craving and withdrawal. Um, this is what uh, how we define addiction. And there are severe cases. Uh, I mentioned how hard these games can be put down, but there are uh, many cases in the, in the media, I found 20, of relatively healthy young, uh, young people who played video games for days or sometimes even weeks at a time without stopping before suddenly dying. Um, and the cause of death is varied, uh, most often a pulmonary embolus where the person was seated for so long without moving that a thrombus, a clot formed in the veins, and then when they moved a little bit, it, uh, it passed off to their lungs. But, but the, the point uh, I'm trying to make is they were so engaged with their gameplay that they ignored their body's basic needs for rest and hydration, uh, movement, and so on. Uh, there are also many cases reported in those media of teens who have committed suicide after their uh, video games were restricted or taken away uh, by uh, their parents. Um, uh, perhaps uh, uh, even uh, just as disturbing, there are, are I found seven cases of since 2007 of young people who have murdered uh, their parents in response to the video games being restricted. Um, there are eight cases I found of infants who died of neglect uh, while the, because the parents were too busy playing video games. The most famous of which is shown uh, here. Uh, it's been made the, the topic of a HBO documentary called Love Child uh, about a South Korean couple whose infant died while they were uh, playing uh, an online game together. Uh, the infant died of, of uh, malnourishment uh, and neglect. And uh, per, perhaps even the most horrifying, there are a number of cases, seven I found in the last few years, of infants who have been murdered by their parents because the infant interrupted the video game play. Uh, for example, example, Alexander Tobias, who, who killed her infant son because his crying was interrupting her Facebook Farmville uh, a game. So um, now these are rare uh, occurrences, um, uh, but it goes to show how someone, how people can be so psychologically dependent on uh, the video games that they, you know, they are willing to kill or die uh, um, uh, for it. Uh, one case that was in the news media that I thought was uh, um, a good sort of case example of this was Quinn Pitcock, who uh, some of you may be familiar with. He's shown here with Katie Couric, um, and uh, he was in the NFL. Uh, he had a successful uh, rookie year playing for the Colts. Um, uh, however, when it came time for the second season's training to start, he uh, Quinn uh, quit and dropped out and turned his back on a very lucrative career. And the reason that he gave for doing that was that in the off season he had developed an addiction to video games. In particular this video game Call of Duty which he would play uh, he said for uh, 14 hours a day, uh, 14 to 16 hours a day, stopping only to sleep um, and to make a once a day trip to McDonald's to get enough food for the day so he could keep playing. And when his concerned family and friends would drag him away from his, uh, from his Xbox, he would spend the whole time thinking about when he could get back um, to playing more. And he was in the news in 2012 because Quinn had gotten some uh, psychiatric help and had been able to go cold turkey off of video games and resume his pro football career. But certainly the, the idea that you can get addicted to video games is very prevalent in American culture from, uh, from uh, a number of different television shows have featured, you know, um, especially sitcoms, characters who have become addicted to video games from, uh, from The Big Bang Theory to iCarly and South Park and The Simpsons uh, to new shows like Dr. Phil and, and, 
and uh, Katie Couric, and even uh, even the super nanny has gotten involved. So this idea, you know, that you can get addicted to video game is games is is prevalent in the American culture, um, and certainly in in China and South Korea, uh, video game addiction is considered to be a major. Uh, public health problem, uh, perhaps the, the biggest public health problem facing their young, uh, their, their teens and young adults, and that governments of both nations have stated so publicly and responded by training thousands of counselors and setting up hundreds of treatment centers, detox facilities, and residential treatment um, facilities to treat uh, video game uh, addiction. And if you're interested in seeing uh, what one of these looks like, uh, there's a documentary called Web Junkie I've shown here which takes you inside one of these Chinese uh, video game addiction um, uh, um, residential facilities which is a, a very harsh uh, place following a military school um, um, model uh, and perhaps, uh, perhaps one would say even abusive uh, to the teens, although the ones in South Korea are, are very different. So, but for all the attention that video game addiction gets in other countries and in uh, the media, there is no official psychiatric diagnosis um, of video game addiction in uh, the United States. Um, so uh, it is not something that, in general, psychiatrists are, are looking for, or um, or you know can bill for treating. Um, that said, there is a large body of research um, by which researchers all over the globe will basically take the same criteria that we use for substance abuse and convert it to just substitute the word video game for the drug or alcohol and then and then interview thousands of young people in these varying nations to see if they will endorse and meet criteria for addiction but to video games. And to my eyes, the uh, results uh, of their studies have been remarkably uh, similar. Uh, in the USA, anywhere from 3 to 9 percent. In South Korea, Taiwan, and Australia, 8 percent. Singapore, 9, China, 10, uh, Germany, 12, and Hong Kong, 15 percent. So, uh, so every researcher who has you know, gone out and asked these questions about whether young people really meet criteria for addiction to video games has found that a substantial minority of uh, young people meets criteria for, uh, for video game uh, addiction. So the, uh, the makers of the DSM, which is the Handbook of Psychiatric Disorders in the United States and in Western countries, uh, responded uh, by um, coming up with uh, a internet gaming disorder, which is not an official diagnosis, but a preliminary diagnosis, um, something that is being uh, tested out before it, it, it is considered official. And I wanted to show you the criteria here. It's a pattern of excessive use, which leads to clinically significant impairment or distress, plus a number of following, uh, the following symptoms. Preoccupation with video games, so you're either spending all your time playing, or when you're not, you're you're thinking about it, uh, like Quinn Pickcock did. Number two, use of video games to alleviate negative mood. Number three, withdrawal. So when you can't play, you become irritable or dysphoric. Number four, the need to spend more and more time playing video games in order to feel satisfied. Number five, a loss of interest in other hobbies. Uh, number six, you've been unable to control or cut down on the amount of time you spend playing video games uh, despite efforts. Number seven, you continue to play despite knowledge of psychosocial problems caused by your gameplay. So for example, you're failing in school, your parents are on your back, you don't spend time with friends anymore, and so on. Number eight, uh, the video game play is jeopardized or caused the loss of a job, a relationship, or a significant educational opportunity. And in the kids I see, most, most commonly uh, what I see is that ever since getting a video game console, they're failing in school. And number nine, uh, the, the person deceives others about the extent of how much uh, the time they're spent playing. And very often when I interview young uh, men, I'll ask them how much time they spend playing video games, and they'll say, oh, maybe an hour or two a day. And then their parents will uh, uh, look at them incredulously and confront them on the fact that, that really it is several times that. So, uh, so these are the criteria for internet uh, gaming disorder. This is a letter that I got from a patient of mine who was uh, finishing what seemed like a, uh, what appeared to be a very successful treatment for depression at um, a partial hospital program that I work at. 
and uh, it says uh, she left this letter because I wasn't there on her last day. Dear Dr. Weigel, today is my discharge day, but sadly you are not here. Lorelai, that's her therapist, keeps telling me I should tell you about my video game addiction. I have a slight obsession with Skyrim, Perfect World International, World of Warcraft, League of Legends, Pokemon, Minecraft, dot, dot, dot. It's pretty terrible because the highlights of my day are reaching different factions in my games. Now, did this girl actually have uh, an addiction to video games? I don't know, and I'll never know because in a socially adept teenage girl, I didn't even think to ask about her video game habits, despite this interest that I have in, uh, in video game addiction. And so this is my concern about our field, uh, mental health field in the United States, is that we're not looking uh, for this diagnosis and we're not asking uh, the right questions. And if we're not, uh, then um, you know research shows us that, the, that these young people are out there who meet criteria for an addiction and if we're not diagnosing it in our practice it may well be because like me in this situation we're simply not asking the right questions. So there's no blood test to see if you're uh, addicted to uh, drugs or not but there are certain changes that happen in the brain that are associated with uh, addiction changes in brain function and structure um, and there is a large body of literature, 29 studies showing similar abnormalities that happen in video game addicts. Um, so uh, for example, dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter which mediates pleasure and motivation um, and uh, we know that illicit drug use causes a spike in dopamine release in certain areas of the brain and playing video games shows the same process, the same um, spike in dopamine release. And over time we know that drug addicts have decreased sensitivity of the dopaminergic reward systems because of these spikes and video game addicts show the same abnormality. Uh, so it seems that anything that's reinforcing enough uh, can be habit forming and addictive and cause these changes. Um, other changes, drug addicts have a signature pattern of brain matter loss. Um, it's it's a fairly complicated but includes reduced thickness of the orbitofrontal cortex, uh, a portion of area of the brain. And this is picked up on MRI or functional anisotropy. Um, and video game addicts have been shown to have this same uh, pattern as, uh, as drug abuse, the same pattern or a similar pattern of, uh, of brain matter loss over time. Finally, substance users have certain deficits on um, that are picked up on neuropsychiatric testing like impaired response inhibition meaning that um, if uh, you come up with a tempting uh, choice something that is wrong but is close to being right substance users are more likely to, to, to choose that impulsively. Um, uh, cognitive bias uh, where substance users are more drawn to thinking about topics that have to do with substance abuse and with executive dysfunction um, which is a, a, a type of a learning problem which has to do with decision making and, and focus. Um, so substance abusers are known to have uh, impairments in these re region, in these areas and video game addicts have been shown in multiple studies to have the same deficits. So it, it seems like according to the best literature we have that, that your brain goes through the same changes whether you're addicted to drugs or to um, behaviors like uh, pathological gambling or video game addiction. So uh, do, uh, do kids grow out of it? Um, uh, is this something that kids are just going to sort of grow out of and, and is not going to be an issue in adulthood? Well, um, when, uh, when uh, this um, uh, graph shows uh, excessive video game play over time and it's the yellow bar that we want to follow in this graph and uh, studies show that addictive play seems to increase steadily from age 6 to about age 16 and at that point it rather levels off um, through the 20s at least until uh, age 26 and plateaus maybe goes down a little bit on average um, which is interesting to me because this is the same pattern we see again with substance abuse. Um, so uh, video game addiction is most commonly comorbid with ADHD and there's something about video games that especially um, uh, appeals to kids with ADHD um, uh, perhaps because it holds their attention like very little else can uh, because it's, uh, video games can be so engaging. Um, disruptive behavior problems are often comorbid so problems with uh, oppositional defined disorder or conduct disorder. Autism spectrum disorder, again video games in particular appeal to, um, to young people on the spectrum. 
Uh, depression and anxiety are often comorbid as well. But I, I'm not familiar with any studies looking at whether bipolar disorder, uh, what the comorbidity of bipolar disorder is with video game addiction. So I don't have anything to report um, on that on that front. Um, so, of course, those are just associations. We don't know what came first. Did the video game addiction cause the depression or vice versa? Um, so there's one interesting study where Gentile looked at third to eighth graders, and he followed them over two years. He found that 8.5% met criteria for video game addiction. Those who, did, who were not addicts at the start of the study, but became or were likely to become addicts two years later were boys. Uh, those who spend more time gaming to begin with, because it's important to uh, me to point out that some people can play excessive amounts, six hours, eight hours a day, and yet not have these criteria for addiction. And the difference is it's the people who uh, can't stop who have a video game addiction. Because some people can play excessive hours, but when it comes time to turn it off, to go to bed, to go do something else, to spend time with their family, to do their homework, they can do it. And they don't have a video game addiction. It's those who can't stop themselves. Um, but, but it seems excessive play is a risk factor for developing an addiction. Also, those with poor social skills, like those on the autism spectrum, those who have poor emotion regulation, and those who have impulsivity, like uh, kids with ADHD. These are the risk factors to develop an addiction to video games. Those who uh, met criteria for video game addiction at the start of the study, 85% still met criteria two years later. So it did seem the diagnosis was very stable, unfortunately. Um, and outcomes included depression, social anxiety, and poor school performance. These are uh, because those who met criteria for addiction were more likely than their peers to develop new onset problems with these issues um, two years later. Um, Sleep uh, and academics are often the first things affected by uh, video game addiction. Video game addicts report triple the rates of sleep deprivation and daytime sleepiness, most often because they stay up late playing games, um, and have more attention problems and worse grades than their peers. And oftentimes, in my experience, they choose to play video games rather than study or do their homework. Um, it's not so much the, the tablet and smartphone games that, that, uh, that these addicted players are playing. It's more likely computer and console games. Fantasy RPG games like World of Warcraft, shooters like uh, Call of Duty, and real-time strategy games like Dota 2. And video game addicts tend to be motivated by achievement and immersion in the, uh, in the in feeling totally immersed in this video game world and status among their, their fellow players. So uh, in taking a, game, a, a history, I often ask how much time does a child spend playing video games? What are the house rules about gameplay, if any? Are there games in the child's bedroom? And how are they, how's the gameplay supervised? Uh, what conflicts arise and, and what results from them? Um, uh, you know, if the, if the parent tells the kid to stop playing the games, does the kid throw a tantrum, then does the parent give up? These are important uh, data, uh, pieces of information in, uh, in, in finding out about the habit. Treatment for game addiction, as far as we know, includes family guidance, uh, therapy, and, uh, and medication uh, treatment. So what is a parent to do about this problem? Um, so here, uh, the family is talking to young Michael and explaining their concern about his video game uh, addiction. But of course, all Michael wants them to do is just to get out of the way so he can continue playing. And it is important to talk to kids about the health risks associated with playing too much, but really it's parents who are ultimately in the best position to shape their child and, and teen's ha video game habits. So the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends establishing a family plan for screen use um, and limiting total screen time uh, their recommendation of the all screens to one or two hours a day, which is a um, which is a pretty healthy goal, but certainly much less than the average American youth is engaging in. Um, they recommend keeping all screens out of the bedroom, monitoring what uh, media uh, children are using, um, and how often they're using, and enforcing curfews for uh, all screens at mealtime and bedtime. And I think this is a great place to start. Of course, if families are going to be restricting the amount of time that kids and teens are spending playing video games, they may make a vacuum, especially in the kids who are spending the most time playing, uh, may create a vacuum in their lives. So it's good for parents and families to encourage alternative activities, um, activities like sports or reading for fun or spending time with friends, uh, so on and so forth, family activities as well.
It's important for uh, other family members to be role models because the biggest determinant of child media habits is parent media habits. And oftentimes parents don't know, but they can set up um, parental controls uh, that will say how much a, any given device will function in terms of how, long, how much it can be used uh, per day or per week or what content will, um, will uh, work on that device and, and they can lock that with a password. Of course most parents don't know how to do this but a simple YouTube search um, with you know, directions for parental controls on Xbox for example uh, will reveal that. When I give talks to parents, uh, there's often parents who, who will say, okay, you, you don't understand, you don't know my son, I'm afraid of what my, my son would do if I took away his games. I'm afraid he would hurt me or even hurt himself. Um, and it's true that suddenly um, ceasing uh, video game access completely, which parents will do when they're very concerned, will frequently precipitate a psychiatric crisis. It's one of the one of the not uncommon reasons for admission to our psychiatric inpatient unit. Um, and so, uh, and especially in kids who have been, who built up the psychological dependence on their games. Um, so oftentimes, trying to come to a compromise, limiting the use is more appropriate. Of course, the parents will need to set up contingency planning if, if a child doesn't follow the rules, and it may be that taking it away totally is the only, you know, is inevitable ultimately. But it, could, it should be avoided if possible. Um, psychotherapy. Well, in general, psychotherapy treatment for video game addiction is similar to substance abuse treatment, including group and family therapy techniques, cognitive behavioral therapy, and motivating motivational interviewing techniques. Often focuses on finding alternative activities and hobbies, um, establishing or re-establishing real-world social connections, preferably among people who don't play ex video games excessively, and overall decreasing the amount of time that one spends playing video games. The goal is not typically uh, uh, abstinence, um, uh, total abstinence from all games. And there is some data that shows that um, uh, psychotherapy can be effective for internet gaming disorder, although in general the, the trials that have been done uh, are generally weak trials. They don't have the best type of, uh, of evidence. So we really need to do more uh, research to find out what the best treatments are. Therapeutic techniques, however, can, um, include engendering insight, you know, uh, that, that uh, kids have to under, be able to understand the impact of gaming on, on their, their lives and on their goals. So it's, it's good to set up a personal inventory, um, a list of things that's important to the, the child or teen, goals they want to accomplish, and then help them see how their video games can play and habits can impact those goals. Practicing the opposite is, is finding a um, an activity that for a child is the opposite of video game play. So this could be going out and playing sports. This could be something something that they love that really has nothing to do with video games. It's important to find and embrace that. External stoppers are things like notes telling you to get off at a certain time, alarm clocks that go off telling you it's time to get off the video games, or the parental controls that, call, that cause the video games to shut down. Setting goals uh, is, is important. Uh, being specific, I'm going to cut down to three hours a day, uh, for example. Um, uh, it's important to set goals and then follow up on those goals. Um, abstinence, uh, sometimes uh, players will realize that they can play games, but there's a certain game they just can't play. When they play World of Warcraft, for example, they just can't stop themselves. So, so abstinence from certain games is often, or certain types of games is often necessary. Um, support groups are peer groups that uh, don't um, don't don't play video games. It's very important for uh, kids to have this, or who don't play video games excessively. Um, so they have to have other kids uh, to um, uh, that they can socialize with, whose lives is not are not you know, revolving around video games. And finally, family support. Uh, I find that really if the, the, the family needs to um, uh, be strong with, uh, with kids, they, need, they can't enable uh, the success of video game play or, or treatment is, uh, it may be doomed to failure. Um, medication trials, I, I want to mention uh, that there are a couple trials showing a benefit of bupropion, in, especially in youth with comorbid video game addiction and depression, uh, which is often comorbid. Bupropion is also called Wellbutrin. It's used often to help with uh, cigarette um, smoking to decrease cravings and also as an antidepressant. And there's a few trials that show a benefit with video game addiction as well.
One trial of methylphenidate, also called Ritalin or Concerta, showed that in kids with ADHD um, and excessive video game play, um, treatment with uh, methylphenidate actually not only helped their ADHD, but, but decreased their video game play as well. Uh, however, I want to point out and stress that these are not very strong studies. These are only a couple small studies, not a high level of evidence, and there's no FDA indication for these medications. Um, but uh, but this is this is the the sum of the evidence we have for medication treatments. Um, uh, even though this is an unrecognized problem, I think it's becoming more common, and it's important to to know that there are these specialized treatment centers that are cropping up for uh, video game addiction, such as um, the Center for Internet and Technology Addiction near, near me in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, inpatient tr uh, treatments such as the Internet Addiction uh, Inpatient Program at Bradford Regional Medical Center in Pennsylvania. Uh, residential programs like Restart in Seattle. Uh, and 12-step uh, program, uh, Online Gamers Anonymous, which was follows the uh, Alcoholic Anonymous 12-step um, uh, program. and. Uh, was created by the parents of a young man who killed himself over his uh, addiction to uh, the video game World of Warcraft. So in conclusion, uh, there is, uh, even though, um, uh, well, there's an extensive uh, body of research that demonstrates that a minority of young people have a behavioral addiction to video games. Uh, how, uh, however, internet gaming disorder is still only a provisional diagnosis in the United States and typically, uh, goes undiagnosed uh, by mental health professionals and by primary care providers. Uh, risk factors uh, seem to include, uh, for developing a video game addiction, seem to include ADHD, uh, poor social skills, and uh, poor emotion regulation, as well as uh, playing video games excessively. Consequences of video game addiction seem to include depression, social anxiety, insomnia, and academic failure. Uh, treatment, as far as uh, as the limited research tells us, is similar to substance abuse and includes parental restriction and counseling. And finally, uh, video game restriction is often necessary in treatment, um, but it has to be handled with care, especially in the dependent youth who need it the most. So that is uh, game over for me, but I want to say thank you very much uh, for your attention. And, uh, and thanks to Debbie Brown and Lucky Walker again for the invitation to talk. And I'd like to remind you that you have the opportunity to support uh, programs like these uh, with a donation to the International Bipolar Foundation. And you can see uh, the website here. Uh, and with that, I'm able to open up the uh, uh, open uh, open this up for discussion uh, for questions and comments. Wonderful. Thank you for your insight and information. And it looks like we do have a couple of questions um, right off the bat here. So let me get to the first one. Um, the first question is, um, what are your thoughts about game developers and, and do you feel that they should be contributing to the prevention of game addiction in some way? Hmm. Yeah, so that, that's a great question, and uh, um, of course game developers, are, are their job is to do quite the opposite. Their job is to create games that are as engaging um, as possible, um, uh, but uh, much like the, the, the cigarette industry, um, you know, many feel that, uh, that if their product is causing these problems, then they need to be part of the, they should be part of the solution. Um, so, given that the game industry is, is reaping massive, uh, um, uh, um, uh, massive profits, you know, at the cost of, uh, of these mental health problems that they contribute to and cause in young people, I, my personal opinion, I don't have a professional opinion on this, but my personal opinion is that it would be reasonable for game developers to, devare, to bear some of the burden in, um, in uh, treating and recognizing and treating these problems. So that's a great question. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, do you also f do you have any suggestions as to how they could contribute, other than you know in the treatment, the after the fact? Well, you know, I think that uh, that if games had uh, easier functionality in which they you could set it beforehand 
to you know give you reminders or uh, to stop or to shut off and and if they could be set up beforehand to function in this way in, in an easier way um, I think that that would be one uh, one way that they could certainly help uh, the problem they could remind you you've been playing for seven hours maybe it's time to take a break this functionality would not be difficult for game developers to uh, to uh, to enter it's just that they don't have any motivation to do that at this point right right okay thank you um, next question is realistically how many hours a day can be allowed not according to the pediatric academy well, um, well, I think that it, it, it does depend uh, on a number of factors. There really, I think there is no highest authority on, on this topic. And I think that looking at the amount of hours of video game play should fit into a overall media plan of how much hours of screen time in general. Um, and, and, and when we're looking at kids who are you know, under two years old, I, I don't think it should be any at all. Um, you know, with with uh, although so many kids are you know watching uh, uh, videos and, and and playing on iPads, um, but uh, there really is not is not a reason for that and uh, uh, not a good reason at any rate. Um, so when we're looking at young kids, I think that you know an hour or two a day of total media content is a, a, a reasonable goal. Um, typically, you know, as kids go to middle school and and teenage years, you know, it's the job of parents to give them more freedom, and uh, and so um, so allowing more screen time in general and video game time in particular uh, is appropriate. And and of course, there are some kids who are just who don't have the interest. Who really they don't need to be restricted because they don't end up watching, spending all that much time playing video games to begin with. But the, the study, there, there are many studies, we, I only talked about addictive video game use, but there are many studies showing that excessive screen time in general is linked to a plethora of health problems from obesity and poor diet uh, to, uh, to behavior problems, uh, attention problems, and, and uh, um, problems getting along with, with peers and, and adults. So, um, so I think that, uh, um, that uh, a reasonable you know, a goal for a teenager might be you know, two or three hours on, on weekdays and a little more on weekends I think is normal because some studies show that how much time kids spend playing uh, so with screen time on the weekend seems to have less negative effects than the amount of time they spend during the week. But it does need to be highly individualized depending on the, on the child's situation. Great, thank you. So on the other hand, do you see any benefit um, to video gaming? Yeah, there is, there is, and you know that was not the focus of my talk. But there are benefits to uh, video game play, especially in moderation. Um, and uh, demonstrated benefits include uh, in improved eye-hand coordination, uh, improved uh, visual attention, um, ability to track, you know, uh, objects in the visual field. Um, also, uh, although the real world. Um, utility of that is not clear. When I when I heard those things, it made me think that video gamers would be better drivers because, of course, driving is is uh, a video, visual attention and and uh, and AI hand coordination are very important. And they might be skilled drivers, but they're not safer drivers. Um, uh, research shows that that those who play a lot of video games are actually less safe drivers than those who are not. Even when you control for a number of different factors like like impulsivity. And, and the reason may be that, that, or the reason seems to be that video gamers tend to be more high risk uh, risk takers while driving. So, and it kind of makes sense, you know, when you're playing a video game, you crash your car, you just sort of get a new one. But I, I'm digressing, sorry. Other benefits of video games uh, play include, um, uh, include educational games can be wonderful teaching tools um, and they can engage kids in a way that other education and uh, video games can um, uh, of course uh, video games are uh, can be important in social connections in a way because uh, especially with boys friendships tend to be based on uh, shared mutual interests and you know if you're the only one who doesn't spend any time playing Minecraft you, for example you may feel left out um, so at times you know uh, games can bring people together um, but uh, you know uh, unfortunately there's this minority of 
of kids who gets into this excessive habit of play that really is very destructive uh, in their lives. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, do you think that video game addiction will become an official DSM diagnosis, or is it currently? Yeah, it is not currently. Um, it is uh, included in the most recent iteration, the DSM-5, as, as a provisional diagnosis. And, and some of these provisional diagnoses will go on to become official diagnoses. Um, that's where, you know, for example, uh, in our last itera iteration, uh, binge eating disorder and uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder were not official diagnoses, but they are now. Um, it's my opinion that yes, it will. I, I, I think this problem is not going away. It's as games become more sophisticated and more engaging, and 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 access that young people have to these games increases. You know, with with uh, all virtually all parents and most teens walking around with a fairly a very powerful video game console in their pocket in the form of, of smartphones, I, I think this, this is going to be more and more of a problem with time and uh, to the point that it can't, it can't be ignored. Um, so it's my belief that it will, yes. Excellent. Thank you for that answer. Um, the next question, do you think that the main cause of video game addiction is um, related to the environment that a person lives in? Um, this person says that um, he can, they can remember um, their addiction started when friends stopped going to school um, as well as him, and he had all day to play, and he wanted to be, as you mentioned, um, doing the same thing as his friends to fit in. So he gave in to those, peer, or the peer pressure. Yeah, so, so that's a great point. I do think environment is is a very large factor. I mean, when we look at the at the, uh, uh, the the risk factors, some of them are sort of inherent, um, you know, like like having ADHD or the autism spectrum or being male. Um, but a lot of it is the environment that that you grew up with. In particular, you know, how much time you're sort of allowed to play or, or able to play, um, and um, uh, whether you have other engaging activities. I didn't mention, but um, but uh, another risk factor is having a having um, a low parental involvement in a young person's life. Um, and uh, so, so, or having poor parental supervision is another risk factor. Um, so, and, and of course, accessibility of the, of the video games. If there are, if there, there's a lot of homes where parents just don't buy these uh, games on purpose. And, and of course, in those homes, you know, the, the kids are less likely to get um, uh, hooked in that way. And, 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 uh, and in the example you gave, you know, the more time you have to, to, to play, you know, again, the more likely you are to, to, to get hooked. So, so absolute environment is a, is, a, um, is a very strong risk factor as well. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, how would you encourage less video playing when it's um, used as an escape? So um, yeah, so and it often is. It often is, uh, you know, uh, sort of a, a, an ultimate escape into an alternate reality, and, and where where you don't have to worry, where it engages your mind to the point where you're not worrying about other things or even thinking about uh, other stressors. But and I think that the antidote is finding alternative uh, um, activities that are are engaging. Um, you know, whether it is uh, whether it is you know sports or whether it is you know, outdoor activities, I think finding that, you know, that other passions, um, because typically in kids, uh, in these kids, there are other passions that they have, whether it's music or whether it's, um, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, um, uh, you know, biking or there's, there's, there, there are other passions they have that you can tap into. And I try to tell my kids, it's not that you shouldn't play, it's just that you want to play smart. Um, because I, again, I'm a, a, a video game enthusiast myself, and uh, and sometimes struggle to control my own, uh, uh, you know, uh, game habits. So um, so I, I certainly understand. But but y y it's all about having a balance uh, in your life, and, and finding that healthy balance um, uh, is is the most important thing. And sometimes it just means having to turn off that one. Again, that one game that you just, it just gets you every time. Sometimes you just have to leave that one alone and, uh, and won't have the, you won't be able to stop with that one. Great. Thank you for that advice. 
So that looks like the, all of the questions for today. Um, if you do have um, an additional question that um, you didn't get a chance to, to ask or you think of it at a later moment, um, you can send me an email, dbrown at ibpf.org and I'd be happy to forward those on to Dr. Weigel. I want to say thank you again, um, Dr. Weigel, for joining us and sharing um, the information that you shared today. Um, and we hope that you all have a great day, um, balance of the day, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks, everyone.